Welcome, everyone. I'm Ashley Coffey, and I'm a consultant on emerging technology accessibility at the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, also known as PEAT. I am thrilled to be moderating this panel on accessible XR training and collaboration. Our panelists today are Tim Stutz, Mark Steelman, Thomas Logan, and Elgin Sky McLaren. I appreciate each one of you for taking the time to join today and share your valuable experience with the audience. Today, we'll be talking about extended reality tools used for training and collaboration and sharing ways that developers can build inclusive XR, taking employer considerations for accessible workplace XR and tapping into the focus areas of each of our panelists to learn a little bit more about their work and their thoughts on the field of inclusive XR. So let's dive in. It's so important that accessibility is baked into the foundation of XR platforms that are being used for things like training and collaboration. The theme of this year's symposium is putting principles into practice. And I would like to ask each of you to talk about specific examples of inclusive training and collaboration tools that are pioneering the way for XR. Tim, I'd like to start with you. Thanks, Ashley. So I can share examples of tools that I've worked on over the past year with the design team at PTC Vuforia, during which we released two different industrial work um, applications for work instructions on the factory floor. Um, these were used on Magic Leap and HoloLens augmented reality, augmented reality head-mounted displays. Um, and the apps are Capture and Vantage. Um, these two apps are, are res respectively designed around capturing images, audio, video, and spatial data. That's the first app, Capture. And the second app is around the playback of instructional content built from the content that's captured in the first app. So there's two different apps. And then that app, can play back procedures to a worker on the factory floor. For instance, someone doing an inspection on a refrigerator or an engine block, basically content that can move with them in the space, augment their experience. So on both apps and platforms, a multimodal input approach um, allows the frontline worker to navigate the unique environmental challenges for hands-free and they are able to switch seamlessly between near field and far field gestures, voice commands and more while working with highly legible and auto scalable user interface. Incredible, Tim. Thank you for sharing. Mark, I'd love to hear a little bit from you. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the example that comes to mind for me is the, the product that I currently work on. Um, I'm a VR developer at a company called Transfer. Uh, we're an education company building a platform to help people from all backgrounds get well-paying jobs uh, through the use of VR training. So I think to me that the most inclusive aspect of our product is that we really support the students before, during, and after the VR experience, um, which you don't necessarily see in a lot of cases. So it's not that we, you know, you just download the app from uh, the Oculus store, for instance, and just try the app. You know, we we make sure that this is really accessible by facilitating all the hardware logistics of getting you know the headsets set up and into the schools and and training these instructors to you know so they understand how to um, put people through vr and also you know working with the institutions and and also government bodies um to to get funding for these schools so that you know the cost isn't just all on the the students and um, and that that cost is as low as possible, and then you know we once they're in the VR experience, you know we really focus on making sure that people can learn at their own pace, right? This makes it a lot more accessible for people of you know different cognitive abilities, and then you know finally we we follow up with these students after the training, you know making sure they're getting on these career paths uh, and you know, by showing them the companies that are hiring in their area for, for these skills and also working with those companies to really communicate, hey, these students have, you know, a really high level of skill after having gone through these trainings. So yeah, that's uh, what I've been working on most recently. 
Thank you, Mark. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that highlights the importance of involving people with disabilities in all stages of the life cycle of not just the design or the implementation, but also the after process of implementation. So I'm glad that you shared your experience. Thank you. Thomas, I'd like to hear from you a bit. What are your thoughts? Sure. Uh, hi, Thomas from Equal Entry, a consulting organization passionate about improving access to XR. I think recently what I've been, I guess, seeing as a success is the ability to do remote uh, user work. So tagging onto the idea of let's get feedback from people with disabilities as part of the XR process. Um, <clears throat> recently, we've been able to do a Zoom call, sharing the Oculus Quest headset into the Zoom. Uh, we worked with Fable Tech Labs in Canada and myself and Amanda and my team are in Japan. We're able to work with Shane Kehoe, who is low vision, see his experience through his eyes in the headset and you know, work collab collaboratively inside of Zoom. And so I think the ability to screen share the headset is at least in this training and improving access uh, a good thing. I think new hardware that comes out, that should always be a goal because even if the hardware software interface isn't accessible. If you can see what someone else is seeing, you can help guide them and maybe work through some accessibility challenges to get to the part that you want to test. So I've definitely been um, appreciating that lately. And I'd say, you know, my other piece in social uh, XR is running a monthly meetup called Accessibility Virtual Reality and trying to learn every month about how do we improve uh, the experience. And so we have had such great success with Mozilla Hubs. And lovely to see Elgin here. We've had a lot of work in our meetup in actually being able to see things that were identified as by people as issues and have those be worked on. Um, we've worked with Altspace, uh, which is owned by Microsoft, and you know they have some great captioning features. We've worked with Spatial VR. We're planning for our next event to look at VR chat. And I guess you know in the scheme of this question. There's something interesting and maybe good for accessibility on all of these different platforms, but the opportunity for a platform to do everything good for all people with all types of disabilities, I think is still there for the taking. Uh, you know, we find different challenges on each platform we try right now. Thank you, Thomas. I appreciate your insight. And I'd like to pass it over to Elgin. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> so my name is Elgin. I'm the product manager on Mozilla Hubs. And what Hubs lets you do is create virtual worlds really easily based in the browser. So um, what makes Hubs particularly like accessible or inclusive rather is the fact that it does run in the browser. And so there is sort of like um, an ease of access in terms of being able to use any sort of device that you want to come in. So you can come in on a desktop device, you can come in a mobile phone, you can come on a VR headset. Um, we've had some really interesting explorations from people in our community, like Thomas as well, um, to be able to come in using screen readers, et cetera. And like, we are still, uh, it's still a work in progress. As Thomas mentioned, there is like no platform at this time that is doing everything perfectly, but I just, I can't stress enough how much I value Thomas's input in terms of, um, this work and, and learning about how people are using our community. Um, so we've seen a lot of really cool stuff happening in hubs over the last few years. It's not exclusive to workplace collaboration. We see a lot of events, a lot of art, et cetera. Um, but workplace collaboration and like getting teams together and sort of like sharing these virtual spaces is one of the most exciting sort of areas that we're seeing people do stuff, especially since COVID people are working remotely and they have a variety of different types of devices that they want to be able to get into these spaces. And also, you know, if you're organizing an event, you don't want people to be left out. Um, so hubs does let people come in through these different tools, et cetera. Um, and we're seeing some really cool opportunities in that hubs is really customizable. So not only can you change like sort of the avatars and scenes in these virtual environments, you can also like, if you are someone, you know, it's, it's not super easy at this time, but you can make changes to the interface itself, which has allowed um, people to create really 
very unique custom spaces for their own like training purposes, et cetera. So like being able to put people into very specific situations and, you know, even changing the UI to match sort of like the feel of their brand or the things that they want people to do. But we've also seen another shout out to Thomas. Um, Thomas, you've been doing some really cool work in terms of like pushing the boundaries of what you can do in virtual spaces in terms of like um, being able to do object recognition, for example, in virtual spaces with people who um, are, are low vision at this time, which is a really big challenge in the space that we're still working on. Um, so anyways, it's been very exciting to see that. I'll probably talk about it again later, um, but back to you, Ashley. Awesome, thank you so much. This was really insightful to hear from all of you. And I wanna kind of shift the conversation a bit to Tim. Um, as a bit of a follow on, Tim, I know we recently presented together and an immersive platform at the Accessibility VR Meetup that Thomas was mentioning earlier, earlier this year. And we chatted about accessibility features that need to be baked into XR platforms. Would you be able to share a bit more about the user experience and what developers and designers should be considering when building inclusive immersive tools? So my hypothesis was that building usable multimodal input augmented reality applications with multi-sensory feedback in an industrial work setting to overcome barriers benefits accessibility as a whole. And examples of barriers head-mounted displays can help overcome. They can optimize for content readability regardless of lighting conditions. They can allow for on-screen text, stronger haptic and visual feedback, which helps in loud settings like the factory floor. And um, they use hand gestures to avoid the need to pick up a hardware controller when not possible. And use far field gestures like the ability to take one's hand and hand cast to an object to select it, a virtual object, and eliminate the need for the user to maneuver over to that object's position. And they can contain calming, simplified um, design and prevent cognitive overload with overwhelming stimuli. So those were some of the user experiences, experience challenges we set out to overcome with these apps. And we wouldn't have been able to understand any of this without understanding our user needs. And that was the result of an ongoing line of inquiry with our customers and um, many on-site visits. Wow, thank you, Tim. I know one big discussion in the community is immersive captioning. And it's so exciting to watch those evolve and shape communication in immersive worlds. Does anyone else have advice for developing inclusive XR tools that users can really engage with? And Elgin, I wanna specifically start with you. Um, so in terms of um, creating immersive worlds, like I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of actually like going out and using um, your product with the community and like seeing how people are interacting with it like the um information that we've gotten from our users about you know the the, the walls they hit and the opportunities they see is is like unparalleled it's really great we have a, our own meetup every week for um people who want to join hubs who like you, you don't have to come but like if people are interested and they want to know more about how it's made or share their thoughts or just like you know come show off some stuff so every friday we get together with people in our community and that's so valuable we've been invited to things like the XR Access Symposium to be able to like talk to real users and also to be able to see some of the stuff that um, groups like um, Thomas Logan's Meetup, um, trying to get more accessible um, spaces created. Uh, I would say is like the number one thing because I, you know, we, we could sit in a dark room all day and try to develop something, but until we see how people are actually using it and the experiences that they're having it in it, um, you know, that <laughs> what we think people are going to do is, you know, meaningless. <laughs> Thank you, Elgin. That's really insightful. And I want to shift it over to Mark. Mark, can you share your advice for teams creating XR tools that are inclusive and engaging? Sure. I, I'll, first, I'll, I'll just second that. Yes, testing is like so important. So <laughs> that's absolutely something that, um, you know, people have to keep at the top of their mind. But uh, aside from testing, uh, you know, I think uh, what, one of the things that's really important is just good spatial design. And, and this isn't really even necessarily an accessibility feature. And, you know, I, I would say that 
a lot of accessibility features are really just features that make your product more usable. So that's another kind of mindset that I think is important to adopt as a, a tools developer in the XR space. But, you know, for instance, good spatial design could just mean like, where is the captions button? Like the actual, you know, there's one thing is having good captions. Another thing is access to turning on those captions being good, right? You know, whether, you know, that's the design of your menu and how you pull that up, having multiple ways to turn on captions, um, you know, and I think that concept of spatial design applies much more broadly than just captions, right? So, you know, I think one thing that we see a lot is it's really tough to balance, you know, realism versus a good accessible user experience, right? Like in our trainings at Transfer, we're trying to replicate real world job training as much as possible, but at the same time, we're in VR, right? We should be leveraging the affordances of VR to make these things easier. So by, you know, doing things like moving all the objects close to the user so they don't have to physically walk, you know, and move their arms really far, right, uh, to, to access the objects in the environment. Um, those kind of, you know, spatial design considerations, I think, are, are, are really important in both VR and AR. Absolutely, Mark, and thank you. And I also want to really underscore here how important it is to design with people with disabilities involved in every stage. We can't know what other people need unless we include them. So to all the developers out there who are listening right now, when you're creating something, make sure that you get input from people with visible and invisible disabilities. And to get an expert take on this subject, Thomas, I'd like to start with you. How can we make sure that people with disabilities always have a voice? and are listened to in the creation of immersive experiences? I think right now with these hardware software combinations, which are pretty much required for doing XR, we have to take a strong approach that you're going to need to potentially fund and or work with a community space, maybe where your organization is based, to enable people to be able to give that input because asking someone to purchase a several thousand dollar piece of hardware that's not accessible to them, you know, it doesn't even make sense. So I think that's just the reality that currently I feel is, you know, potentially if you are a hardware manufacturer, making sure you're finding local organizations, maybe where you can invite your software developers to say, we've um, enabled, you know, and the one I like to say, New York Public Library in New York City, Chansey Fleet, she has a great community of, of people who are blind and low vision that come to the library, and it's a public space where they can come. If they had access to that hardware, there's a lot of people that, you know, would be interested, I think, in giving feedback and participating in the design. But that's a challenge that at least I've experienced in the years so far working on this is that if someone doesn't have the hardware, how can you get their input on what you're building? Thank you, Thomas. I've learned so much from just listening to people talk about their experiences with XR. And I know one of my colleagues had a really transformative experience using an art app in VR that helped her see more details and feel more connected to the artistic process after vision loss. Hearing experiences like that can really shape the way that these tools are created and to open the door for similarly wonderful experiences. Remember, inclusion needs to happen at all points in the creation process. Asking at the very beginning or the very end isn't going to cut it. You need the perspectives of people with disabilities and lived experience throughout the entire process. Now, I wanna shift the conversation just a bit to Mark. There's a specific topic that tends to come up when getting input from people with disabilities, and that's conflicting accessibility needs so that everyone can collaborate effectively. For example, in a virtual space when someone who is deaf needs to see the speaker's lips to read, while well, perhaps the speaker has low vision and prefers to go off camera to read their speaker notes. While that's just one example, can you talk a bit about the creative solutions for conflicting needs that you come across in immersive spaces? Sure. Thanks, Ashley. 
Um, I think, you know, the, the most fundamental principle to keep in mind here is just providing flexibility to your end users. Um, so that flexibility can come in a bunch of different forms, you know, one of which is just hardware flexibility, right? Different hardware is going to offer different features and, you know, that hardware might be suited to more suited to one group or another. Um, so making your applications cross platform is, is really important. Um, you know, OpenXR is kind of one uh, example of, you know, kind of leading the platform side of making uh, cross platform XR development easier. Um, and it's something that we're really actively looking at at transfer. Um, and, you know, uh, Putting, putting your applications on different platforms can also uh, be, you know, not just immersive platforms, but also non-immersive devices like webs. Hubs is a, you know, a great example of that. Um, and then, you know, there's also kind of software flexibility. Um, so allowing your users to kind of remap their inputs to, to suit their needs best. Uh, different locomotion methods, right, so that they can navigate virtual spaces, however, is most comfortable for them. Um, making your interactions work for either hand, right? Um, and, you know, I think there's a, a lot that can be done in that space. But again, you know, the, the really important principle is, you know, giving options to your users in as many ways as possible, so that you're not really having to even think about you know, targeting each particular audience, you just know that fundamentally by having options, you are going to be able to reach uh, a variety of different audiences. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. And I want to take a moment to talk about using XR tools and the workplace, the ultimate space for training and collaboration. I know in my work at Pete, this has been a huge focus from healthcare to manufacturing, extended reality tools can help employees train, perform their jobs and upskill. So that means that the XR tools need to be inclusive to ensure that every employee has the same options and opportunities. What I'd like to ask each of you is what do employers need to think about when they are procuring XR tools to make sure that they are accessible and inclusive for employees? I mean, the type of devices that people have access to is one of the really big ones. And so doing your research uh, in terms of like, you know, are you going to be supplying people with XR or like headsets, for example, what company is manufacturing these headsets? Are there privacy concerns that come along with this? Um, and then also like, is that our headsets usable by people? And so if people are not able to use a headset for any sort of reason, is there some sort of alternative that's available to them? That's, that's great, Elgin. I think one thing that I wanted to add is just you know, the importance of understanding the accessibility of the products you're using. So, you know, one thing that you can look for is whether or not a product has completed a VPAT assessment. Um, so, you know, just understanding, you know, the extent to which a particular product is accessible to different abilities, you know, is, is super important. Uh, it's not necessarily the most common thing to see in the XR space. Um, we recently at Transfer completed a VPAT and it was not easy because we have a lot of different content that varies in the level of accessibility. Some things require two hands, some things don't, right? But if we want to try to assess the entire product, right, we just have to say, you know, on the VPAT, some of these things, uh, you know, support uh, users with uh, mobility issues. But yeah, just getting a sense of, uh, you know, any information you can get on the accessibility of a product is, is uh, to me, the first step. Yeah, I just want to add to me, it's awesome that uh, Mark's company has the VPAT. You know, I think my belief is if someone here on the call is a procurement officer or, you know, a procurement officer, I mean, one of the only other ways in the American context to really advocate for accessibility other than suing people is the procurement policy. So I truly believe that if someone does excellent work and can show that in the VPAT, they should win the contract. That is basically how this is designed. And so that's my hope for XR companies that do take the effort to do the work, uh, you know, document it via that process and 
the law is sort of set up that way for procurement to say you are supposed to procure the most accessible product. So if your product's more accessible than your competitors, that should be a, a sales point for you. And I would really like to always, I, I as in my own work, would love to promote your company if you're doing that work, because I would like you to get more sales because you're doing great work. Absolutely. There's just such a huge ROI on making your products accessible, not just the platforms, but the hardware as well. So definitely take note of that if you're listening. All right, everyone. Last question. What is one tangible, inclusive improvement that you want to see next in XR? What's that number one on your wish list for training, collaboration, or just in general? And Elegant, I'd like to start with you. How can I pick just one? <laughs> you know, it's an exciting space to be in because there are so many improvements that can be made. I mean, like, I'm not trying to like slam the industry, but it's just like there it's just it's a new space. Right. And so we're constantly improving um, like it's it just changing all the time. So like on hubs, for example, one of the next things that we're working on is improving our like object controls in world. But we're also like longer term vision. We're looking at doing more um, of a deep dive in terms of accessibility on our product. And, you know, there's just there's tons of room for improvement there. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> I can't I can't pick just one, but I'm hopeful that in the next year or two or three and like five years down the road that, you know, XR products just generally are going to be much more accessible for people. Thank you. Uh, Tim, would you like to share? One of the things that's really exciting that is on the horizon and is actually no longer horizon, but here is uh, the use of non-invasive BCIs or brain computer interfaces to aid in the understanding of user intent. So we've seen some startups in the space, um, some of the work that Cognition has done with their Cognition One head mounted display specifically to benefit users with unique motor and speech abilities stands out. Um, the ability to think of an interaction goal and have a BCI algorithm interpret it as an action, like an action around multiple choice or typing text, et cetera, um, has a huge benefit for accessibility. Um, particularly with those users, um, but also just populations as, as a whole, understanding the user intent um, is going to put us leaps and bounds ahead. Um, there's also a benefit to the amount of clutter that can be removed in UIs once we understand better what users want to do. So BCIs will help us get there. Echoing, of course, that there should be so many of these, but I have the passion in our work here, even at XR Access in the Accessible Development Group. I really care about uh, people who are blind accessing these worlds that are being built. And so my, you know, my start of my career, even in accessibility, was thinking about uh, ancient world maps being accessible. And so I'm very into the idea that uh, the same way that you have an alt text for an image element on the web, just really need that to be super pervasive. There's a lot of work to be built on top of that, but right now I'm, I'm very passionate on, let's make sure that objects can communicate at least the same name that when you're searching for them in like a store to place them in your world, have that name come through so that someone that uh, wants to understand how you've constructed or built your virtual world, they wanna know the time you put into it. Uh, that would be my number one right now. And if you are into that, you can join our group at XR Access. And we're working on that right now. Wonderful. Thank you. And Mark? It is hard to choose. But if I had to choose, I would say getting hardware providers and XR app stores to require accessibility features, such as captioning and providing clear guidance on you know how to implement those features so that developers can easily budget them into their application development from the beginning, not after the fact, that would be a really awesome thing to see. Um, you know, you, these platforms aren't going to be able to add all of the requirements for accessibility all at once, but like uh, Meryl always says, progress, not perfection. And, um, you know, I think another thing that goes hand in hand with that is, you know, getting the development platform providers, such as the game engines, 
to build example tools, example implementations um, that fit these requirements so that developers don't just have to reinvent the wheel um, and, or if they don't have the you know, resources to do so. Thank you, everyone. This was an exciting discussion. And thank you all for sharing your very valuable perspectives today. For anyone interested, please visit peatworks.org. That's P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S dot org for the inclusive XR and hybrid work toolkit I mentioned. If you have any questions for the panelists today, we're happy to answer them throughout the conference and beyond. Thank you to our wonderful audience for attending today. And I sincerely hope that you take action and help prepare us to get closer to a future where XR is inclusive. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley.